Hello friends, Alexander Pope's essay on criticism is for many critical precepts, it's important, but more than that I think it is, it is a poem where you have got <coughs> quotable quotes, like a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, isn't it? Very often you come, to err is human, to forgive is divine. These things are very often quoted. Alright, so in anyway, the first part we are now dealing with this lines 1 to 2, 101 and there we saw that it's all about the rules for studying the criticism as well as creative writing, that is poetry. Now we saw eight, first eight points, first who should be more skilled, the writer or the <coughs> sorry, critic, that is um, if the critic is then he will mislead you. If the critic is unskilled, he will mislead you. If the poet is unskilled, he will bore you. <laughs> That's why. If he won't do any harm to you. Secondly, we saw no judgments are the same. Nobody's judgment. No two judgments are the same. So also, just like no two watches are the same. So you have to be very careful about these judgments. Isn't it? Yeah. Then third point is seeds of <coughs> glimmering light creativity and the criticism also. It is given from heaven. And what we have to do is that everybody has it, but what we have to do is that you have to nourish it. Right? Yes. Then next point is that the um, poet, uh, poet critics, that I don't know why he does he say, I already told you that. Now, poet critics are like mules and half-formed uh, uh, insects. You should command only one province, etc. He said. Then uh, next is that fifth one is follow nature. Yes. So find the limits. You will, you should see your limits, and then you can see nature there. And also uh, from nature you can learn many rules. And nature is rules methodized. He said methodized. And also 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 you find the the Greeks, isn't it? And uh, sixth point we saw wit and judgment. And uh, wit and judgment usually at strife, but uh, what we should do is that the uh, wit should control judgment, oh, sorry, judgment should control wit. That is, the muse's steed should be checked. Then you can get bet, uh, best out of the muse's steed. And seventh one is the rules. Rules that uh, you, sh you we should follow. And there again he says that uh, he is uh, telling us about second of repetition, I think, that ancients and nature and so on. And the uh, eighth is, eighth point that we saw is that uh, should uh, learn from Greeks. That is, the Greeks, they showed the Parnassus, that is the abode of the uh, muses to her daughters, so her sons and daughters. And then also the, he, Greek, the Greeks taught them how to attain the immortal prize by working hard, hard work, isn't it? Now the uh, ninth point is, now we have more eight, eight more points in this, the ninth point is, critics, <coughs> the, what the generous critic does, the ninth point is generous critics, generous critics, generous critics will admire the poet, see poet, the, the general critics will fan the poet's fire. He will find the poet's fire. Miss imagination. Encourage it. Encourage it. And uh, also he says, and uh, uh, so that the world uh, will admire, find out the reasons for the world to admire them. Understand? So that is the, that's what the generous critic should do. Teach the world how with reason to admire. And the generous critic should do Critic is the handmaid of the muses and dress her in all her charms and make her beloved to others. That is what they say. Understand? So, a generous critic is always a supporting or is a supporting so of the writer. So, he dresses with the uh, muses. The generous critic is the handmaid of the muses and the muse is dressed properly and we made her beautiful so that the world admires and the, the muse becomes beloved. So that is a figurative speak means the poets becomes beloved. Understand? And then uh, there are other types of uh, uh, critics. They, they are like duplicate things like, or 
See, <clears throat> two ways you can approach a text. One is that you read the original text and teach the students. And the other is you go for a guide. See, so that is you try to reach the mistress, but you are unable to. So what do you do? You take the maid. You woo the maid. Woo means fall in love with the maid. That is this cheap things. Then what I would say that guides. I am not saying that all guides are cheap things. No, but anyway, it is not. It's not up to the uh, mark of the text. So they woo the uh, maid. Like, is a comparison is given. Instead of using or uh, somebody is working apothecary, you know, compound. A person works with a uh, with a doctor. He is an apothecary, and then he cannot become a doctor. So what he, what happens is that he remains an apothecary, and then he he has learned little bit little knowledge. He starts prescribing medicines and so on. And this master fool, that's what he, says, he creates all kinds of problems. Or what do we say now? Fake, fake doctors. See that? Like that. They become fake doctors. So like that you have got critics. Critics who cannot read the original text and understand the rules and so on. They go in for duplicate things like this. And they, they, become, they say that oh, we are masters. And they start the, Prescribing rules for the poets to write. They are master fools according to them. They create a lot of mischief also to the world. Understand? That's one type, one the second type of critics. A third type is, oh, I don't know, generous critic. Then second is apothecaries. Apothecary critics. Like apothecaries. See that? They are uh, second rate people, but they uh, appear. Or they pretend that they are like doctors and then they prescribe. So also the second uh, type of or duplicate critics we can say duplicate. They they mislead the people. Lot of them. They are master fools. So Pope says that the Pope Pope comes heavily upon the such people. They are master fools. First is the general critic. Second is this type. Third type of critic is that he is like moths. Moths, what do they do? They eat the paper, the paper of the book, pages of the book. So they sit there and eat, but they can't understand. See, they are like moths. Moth, like the moths, eat the paper of paper, means pages of the book. They go on reading, but they don't, they can't understand. They are actually what is called, you know, a kind of uh, people. Uh, they fail. <laughs> To understand the thing, you can read Aristotle poetics hundred times, but still, if you can't understand, it, see like that, uh, you remember tradition and uh, individual talent. You can go on saying pastness of the past, pastness of the past, pastness. Of the past. Now, what is this pastness of the past? Some people they find it difficult to, uh, after going through many times this pastness of the past. What is it about? Nothing but it is the existing uh, European literature. Isn't it? Even if you re understand that, you'll see it's nothing but the existing European literature. That's so, all. Uh, that is pastness and the past means. What do you have to You have to change. A uh, better author will change it. And then past is, um, <coughs> present is directed by the past and past alters the other. And the present alters the past. Present is uh, <coughs> directed by the past and the present or test the past. This is both ways. Now, if you want to read, 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 and still you don't get that point, you know. So there are such, such, such people. And then there are the fourth type of people. They are actually idiots, modes. <laughs> That's what he Pope says. Pope says like that. And that means that there are dry, dry people, dry. Dry minds, they are dry fools, they say. Because they have no invention. They are so dull, but they write rules, they write down rules. Why should, what kind of poem, poem how a poem should be written and so that is, And that he says, it is like a wild balls in cricket game. Wild balls, you know, in cricket game. Cricket game. Is it you, you ball, but it doesn't go anywhere near the wicket. See? So that is 
they are such people. If they are dry people, they have no invention, nothing like this. So these are the <coughs> uh, four types of critics. He said. Generous critics, nice people. Apothecaries, second rate people. Moths, don't understand anything, but they read. They are like bookworms. And for dry and no invention. But still, dry and no invention. And still, what do they do? They prescribe rules which is which has practically nothing to do with creative right? You got the point. See that? Now, uh, the next point is, that is uh, 10, isn't it? 10 point is, how should you critic? How should a critic be? As I said, how should? The process of criticism involves what? The process of criticism. If you really want to cr criticize, criticism means appreciate, what, what should you do? You should be, you should, uh, you really want to judge. You should uh, study the character, the fable, the subject, the scope, in, in every page he says. It means every, every, of every author. You want to criticize an author? You want to assess an author? You want to pass their demands on an author? What we should do is, you should have shown now his character, his fable, his subject, his scope, and the, the age in which he lived. The age in which he lived. You should have close reading, not uh, as some books are to be tasted, some are to be chewed and digested. That is what Bacon said. So you have to chew and di digest the book. Digest the book if you are a, if you are a sincere critic. Understand? And he says, you read Homer. You read Homer during the day and meditate on Homer during the night. And then write down the maxims. And then judge. That means <clears throat> Homer is he's taking only an example. So you read these books like this. Then fi finally what will happen is that you will know how to, what, what a poem is, how a poem should be written. So you can make generalization. See that? And he says, look at Mandu and Muse. Mandua. Mandua. Mandua is the place where Virgil was born. So sometimes he is known as Manduan Muse. Manduan Muse. Man to one Muse. That is Virgil. So look at him. He is one of the best genius he can say. But still he learned. He had the humility. He had the mind to learn, step down and learn from Homer. Understand? That is what you should do. So to be a good critic, this is what you do. Subject, scope, fabula, that is fable, his style, everything, and the age in which he lives. And then 11th point is about Maro. Maro. Maro is uh, Virgil. Again Virgil. Now, what happened to him? He learned from Maro, that is Virgil. What, what did he do? Without any care for, he thought, oh, I am a big man. So he thought that I can write a, an epic. So he started writing. He started writing, his design was so huge. Alban and Rome. But he found that it doesn't reach anywhere. So what happened is, then he got the idea, oh, there is another great poet. So he started studying this. All these things. In this way, that is his character, his fable, his subject, his scope, and his age. And then he found, oh, there is such rules out there. And these rules I must also follow. So he got down and, uh, and started learning these rules. After that he wrote. And whatever he wrote after that, each and every line, if you read, you will find that it is personally supervised by the Stagirite. Stagirite means Aristotle. He was born in Stagiria, and therefore he is known as Stagirite. Since we are born in India, so we are, born as, we are known as Indians. So 
then that is what each critic should do. Such a genius as Virgil had the, the humility. Then when he found that his scheme practically doesn't reach anywhere, so what happened is he sat down and thought, what to do? Where will I find some, some way to put this in the structure? Ah, he said, the formalist. So he started reading Homer and finally, and after that, whatever he wrote, whatever he wrote, and this, as if it is uh, supervised by the study rights. Understand? Yes. Then, giving so much importance to rules, 12, giving so much, that the second, uh, 12th way. He gives so much importance to rules, but he says about geniuses, that, that part we mu you must read, geniuses. Who are the geniuses? Geniuses are above the rules. Shakespeare, <coughs> no rule will bind him. Understand, geniuses. They are good nameless graces. They don't require any method or rule. They don't want to be taught, no need to be taught. They are master hands, they are master minds. They have got a lucky license, he says. They are boldly, they boldly deviate from the existing rules. They are gloriously offend. These are all phrases that I am, have taken from the text. There is some brave disorder that you find. Because in France, you remember, no? in, when, we were, when we were reading Dryden, you saw, like in French people, they were so much bothered about rules, uh, that is, uh, unities of time, place and action. But then what I mean, Shakespeare wrote the Winter State with none, none of these things. You see. And later what happens is, Dr. Johnson also supported Dr. Johnson. What is that? You know that the theater is not uh, Illyria. You know the theater is not Rome. Then why can't you also imagine that this is not uh, it did, it did not happen within 24 hours of time. The thing did not happen. So later when you see Dr. Johnson, you find the same thing. So that is Shakespeare. So and people say, tragedy and comedy should not be mixed. So, you know, Shakespeare says, here you have got my genius. You can see. Why why should you always be brooding out or gloomy like a monk in a cloister? You can have someday you can be uh, feel express or you can <clears throat> the passions, then after some time you can also have some comedy, some happiness, so mingle the drama. So the people will go and shout like, hey, this is Raj comedy, this is and this. And there are too many people in this and so on. But then Shakespeare says, bye bye, hi, ta, ta. if you want, you read. And that's, what, that's what Shakespeare is. Understand? So that is, <clears throat> boldly deviate, gloriously often, the brave deserve. And what criticism cannot do anything with them. Criticism cannot meant because beyond the reach of heart, beyond the reach of heart. It is like Pope says that some kings they make laws, then after some time they withdraw those laws. So, that, so those who made the laws, they themselves withdraw it. They themselves cancel it when they find a work like this. And then he say, look, 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 you look around in nature, you will find them. maybe a hanging rock. What a strange thing it is. The rock is hanging, but it's so beautiful. Niagara waterfalls. Can any rule bind such a, the, such a uh, uh, splendid sight? Spectacle, not a sight. A splendid spectacle. Can anyone control it? So, the luxury and fancy of a creative genius can be, can, uh, nobody can put within rules. That's what it is. Very beautiful uh, uh, passage here. We must understand that Pope wrote this in what age? Neoclassical age. What's the peculiarity, special characteristic of uh, neoclassical age? Rule bound. Everything rule, 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 perfection, ancients. See, what does he say about ancient? Immortal hairs of universal praise. That's what. So actually, this essay is for that. This essay is written for praising the immortal source of the universal plane. That is the Greeks. 
But Ishma, even then he says, you cannot do anything. Some hanging precipice or some <coughs> shapeless rock. This is no rule. There is no, we can't see anything. How does it hang there? But it attracts the wonder of we are wonderstruck and thunderstruck. And it does what happens. So it's like that. When you read Shakespeare's places, Homer is like that. See that? So, what to do? These things, they are like a. The kings themselves, they withdraw their laws. That is, lawmakers themselves say, no law is applicable here. Understand? Yes. And now, 13th point is so that is about geniuses. That passage you must read at least. Thirteen point is about moderns offending, moderns. See, moderns, some moderns will think, ah, then in that case we will also make some brave disorder, some glorious, we will offend, and things like that. And he says, don't transgress rules. Unless, <coughs> unless you are compelled by need, circumstances. And even if, Suppose you have to break a rule, then you should call precedence. Ah, yeah, see, this is Shakespeare did like. Or John Gibbs by himself like this. Or Shelley is like this. His imagination is like. This. If not, the, there will be some remorseless critic. They will come after you. They will destroy you. You see, they will put you within his the boundaries of his laws. They will, they will force you to obey the, their rules. Their rules. They may be secondary people. They may be duplicate critics. Understand? We should not do that. That's what it is. So, the, the laws can break it, but there should be uh, what is what you call is uh, <coughs> uh, this uh, uh, with, with the precedence. Understand? And then uh, the fourteenth point is is about uh, modern geniuses. You can say. See, there are people modern extra geniuses who have got extraordinary uh, gifts. What is it? There's a money. He says, don't go around displaying your um, uh, displaying your free beauties. It will be monstrous for this. Listen, people will misjudge you. Don't use your freer beauties out of context. Don't do it just for the sake of displaying. See? But in context, they will be all right. That's what he says. Because he says, he says, he says that um, the powers of a chief, he won't go around boasting and displaying. That he will never do that. He will conceal them. He will not go, see, I know this, I know that much like that. He will conceal them. That's it. And then the last line in the passage is, Homer nods. And we are left to dream. Sometimes we will say, Homer is not uh, so brilliant in this passage. See, you can't be, you need not be always in every passage brilliant. That what will happen is you will go away from the topic, subject. There is a chance. And there's also a chance that suppose suppose you have you have got a <coughs> you have got a what uh, five thousand rupee shot. Suppose every day you are using five thousand rupee shot only. Uh, people will say something is wrong with them. At times you should use say hundred rupee shot, then two hundred rupee shot, and then when the occasion comes you should use such god interest. Then people will appreciate it. Right? So also is that. Jilebi is a good thing. Suppose you eat jilebi all the day, and uh, whoever comes to your home, you give jilebi, you become sick. You become sick, they also become sick. Like that. So your bullet should not be always displayed. See, look Homer again. Look at Homer from that. At times, you will think that Homer is nodding. Right? <laughs> Understand? But actually, and we are left to dream. Means expect. What comes from that 
uh, pen next. So a genius should be like that, you see. It's not all the time. And the fifteenth point is that the, he says the ancients are above above sacrilegious hands. Sacrilegious hands. That means what? That they are high above. So the sacrilegious hands should not touch, cannot touch them. They are high above the above the Autumn, neither flames, nor war, nor rage, nor rage, tsunami, or oki, none of the floods, none of these things can touch them. So let us let us pian spring, he says. Pian. Pian means a poem that you, a song that you sing uh, on triumphant occasions. Praising, pian ring, this pian ring is this. Understand? Then he says, <clears throat> each age, each age is learning from them. You take something from them. It is like, he says, they are standing, masters, and you go and take from them and come back. Incense is taken from them. So he says, let there be a generous course of mankind praising them. Hail, birds triumph. Birds, birds triumph and he says. Birds triumph and hail. Let everybody see that. Then he says, immortal heads of universal praise. They are immortal. Uh, uh, hairs of universal place. So, nobody can touch them. Again, I told you, know, the main thrust of this section, the whole poem, especially this section, you saw four times he is referring to the ancients so then, and projecting Homer and also Aristotle. So, you see, they are immortal hairs. They are immortal hairs of, of <coughs> universal place. So you should. Langinus says, no, you should write right for posterity. If unbribed posterity, right answer, if unbribed posterity praises you, that praise is valid. That Shakespeare happens, no? Unbribed posterity praising Shakespeare, and so therefore that praise is valid. And sometimes what happens, you know, in, in our age, you know, some people they <clears throat> they celebrate their victories. First, what they do is they call some people and they arrange an event management affair. There's a, this much money will be given to you. You must arrange the, a birthday party for me. For me. <laughs> the person gives the money and says. It's not like that here. Here it is unbribed posterity. And this unbribed posterity is price you want. Then as yes, it is said, what will happen is that you will be writing for posterity and so the person will alter the past. You can see this idea of this uh, traditional individual challenge. I, I, I have also pointed out the same thing in Dryden's no? dramatic poesy and here also this is the thing. This is the immortal place. See that? And, uh, and the last point, 16th point is that they are continuing their praise, but with a slight difference. The difference is this, that is, this, it is like the ancients and their wisdom is like a stream, flowing stream, flowing stream. What happens when the stream flow, when the stream is flowing, what will happen? First it will be narrow, then as it flows, it will become wider and wider and wider and wider like. So this is what happens to <coughs> what happens to the ancients and their wisdom. And he says, nations unborn, they are taking from this celestial fire. Nations unborn are waiting for this celestial fire. What is this heavenly glow? Celestial fire? You you imbibe. See, you allow yourself to be influenced by this celestial fire. Then what happens? 
your mind will glow but when you start writing your hands will tremble why to admire superior sense and doubt you wish when you write you will admire the superior sense of the ancients so then your hands will start shivering because you doubt whether you have got that much superior sense or not with this we come to the end of the first part of pope's essay on criticism i think i have put it i will just go through this once again that is up to eight point is almost everybody is clear i think eight point we have already seen second now the nine is the critics then the critics are there critics like moths are there critics like apothecaries are there critics like a dry no invention are there then <clears throat> if you judge then there should be you should learn the character the fable the subject the scope everything by right? you know that is it and uh, <clears throat> read homer and also meditate on him that's what it is mandavan muse that is well from burjil and what happened to burjil burjil or maro why he is also known as maro he said he started a big design a huge design then he found that it is impossible so he uh, and took the help of homer's ideas and also aristotle's and then he find genius passage and genius nobody can do anything with if you when you go to for excursion and so on so there is in north india and madhya pradesh there is a place there is a waterfall called padalpani i don't know whether you have gone there padalpani oh water is if you go there you tremble when you stand here it is there now i do not know whether they have made construct some dam against the, that river or no i do not know on the i crossed the dam, across the river i have no idea but that when 1962 63 then i was in indo madhya pradesh we went for a, we went for a picnic there and so padal pani so be so that was in november so it's not much water but still so that uh, what about is uh, that we must have be tremble when you start go near that you can't go near but somewhere near you can go and see so that is like genius so that is beauty of nature there no rules and no laws sublime the sublime has no rules the sublime need not obey any rules like shakespeare that is and then we also saw that the modern transgress you can transgress but you should quote the ancients this means precedence so that and then next moment is about modern geniuses don't go around displaying your think of homer homer knows and we are left to dream as a understand yes then of course is things of the, the last two uh stay passages are all about ancients you cannot trust them psychically nothing either natural forces or supernatural forces or that's why you know <coughs> that's why uh, saving the byzantium uh, wb s says no such a form as Gold, uh, the Grecian goldsmith make. So such a form as a Grecian goldsmith make. That is about these ancients. You cannot do anything with them. Yes. And then he says it is like a stream. It is like as it widens. What? The wisdom of the ancients. And it is like a celestial fire. And you go and drink from it. cannot drink from fire you know <laughs> this metaphorically i am speaking and when you come back you start writing when you are mind but still your hands will tremble because you you are afraid you feel you are so humble that you feel that am i worthy of uh, writing like this in imitation of these ancients so he says immortal hearts immortal im- immortal heart of universal place i'm uh, sorry not a heart but hairs immortal hairs of universal place so they are immortal hairs of universal place actually this essay is about that they are the hairs of him so neoclassicals were so much 
influenced by the, the by this uh, uh, ancients, you see. Ancients. So you say, yeah, follow the ancients, then you will be all right. That is the slogan. Follow the ancients, then everything will be all right. Yes, that is that is that is the point that uh, uh, Pope is focusing in this essay. I hope that you are following and you are enjoying. And tomorrow or the next time when we meet again, we will pass on to part two. Part two deals with the, the causes for wrong judgment. This, of course, I told you, you know, there are some inconsistencies are there. For example, there are two occasions where he speaks about fallen nature. And, and uh, in ancients also there is some inconsistencies are there. Otherwise, as a whole, it is perfectly done, and we hope that you, we also get some idea. You know, if we, without uh, having the skill, we should not attempt, you know. <laughs> that's it. And the judgment, is, you should be very careful, otherwise you will be misleading. And about judgments, you know, the general rule is that uh, no two judgments are the same. So there are many uh, things that we can learn from this essay, useful to our life, and therefore, for the time being, why have a nice time, enjoy you.